good God. He's good all the time. It's good to see you all here. And uh, today is the day of Pentecost. And uh, most of you know uh, that the, the Jewish feast days all had a significance. They had a significance in uh, prophetic, uh, prophetically that uh, the, the, the day of Pentecost, which in the, in the Hebrew would be Shavuot, and they would celebrate that. It was, a, it was a remembrance of when Moses went on Mount Sinai to get the law. It was 50 days after they, they came out of Egypt. Moses went up on the mountain and got the law. The law was given, and uh, that was a remembrance of that. And it's interesting because on the day that Moses, when Moses went up and got, uh, and got the law from, from, uh, from God on the day of, on uh, the 50th day after they, their escape from Egypt, uh, if you remember, the law was written in stone by the finger of God. On the day of Pentecost, the, the law was written on our hearts by the finger of the, by the hand of the Holy Spirit. On the day of uh, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, how many remember 3,000 people died because they made the golden calf? On the day of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people got saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's so much more, but we were thankful that God gave his spirit. I always like to say that the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Now, it's not the, the church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. But the church, the body of Christ, I said the church is not a building and it's not one particular organization or a particular congregation. It's made up of believers everywhere in all different places, speaking all different kind of languages. All, you know, everything uh, can be different about our culture or whatever, but one thing is the same. The Holy Spirit that dwells in me is the same that dwells in somebody in Africa and China and Asia, that, that dwells up the street and around the corner. It's the same Holy Spirit. And what makes us members of the church is not saying, I want to join the church. It's when we get born again and saved, we get baptized into Christ, we become a member of the church, the body of Christ. Before the day of Pentecost, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. After the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Paul says, we, there's a new man made up of Jew and Gentile, of spirit-empowered believers that are called to be witnesses to who Christ is. That's what Pentecost is all about. We celebrate it. Uh, when people say Pentecost, they think about talking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit, and that's great. We do that. We pray. We thank God for that. But more than that, more than that, we're called to be witnesses for Christ. I want you to read with me a little bit. You know, a lot of people say, well, Pentecost, you're going to go to Acts chapter 2. Well, we're not necessarily going to go there. We're going to go to Acts chapter 1, okay? Because I think we all know what happened in Acts chapter 2, right? They were in the upper chamber. We sang about it. In the upper chamber, all in one accord. Holy Ghost descended and uh, fill them with the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire and so forth. But I want to start with Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to start in verse, uh, verse 4. And we're just going to read a bit uh, this morning. And being assembled together with them, meaning Christ was assembled with his disciples. Uh, this was uh, 40 days after his resurrection being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. God promised, he said, listen, the Father has promised you. He made a promise to you. He made a promise to you. And here's the promise. He says, for John truly baptized with water, John the Baptist. He says, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Remember, we talk about being baptized, being immersed. He's saying in just a few days, you're going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit has always been active. The Holy Spirit has always been active on the earth. In the Old Testament, King David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He was always with us. He always did the things that uh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit did. He empowered people uh, to be witnesses. He empowered people to do the things that, that God was calling them to do. And so he's always been active. But now there's something different. Matter of fact, Jesus said that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist, he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. But the, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. Why? Because we, have, uh, uh, we possess the Holy Spirit in a way that they could not have possessed it. Because Christ had not been offered yet. The blood had not been offered yet. But now he's saying, listen, there's a promise I'm going to give you. You're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Verse 6. 
When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And that was their question all the way through this whole thing. They thought he was going to be the king. Is it now? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. In other words, he's saying, listen, that's really kind of not any of your business. But you shall receive power. Okay, see, this is, this is better. It's better than knowing, and I, I believe in studying prophecy, and I believe in, in understanding the end times. That's important. Please don't misunderstand me. But more important than that is we need power. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You can spend a whole lifetime getting doctorate degrees and this and that and everything else and have all kinds of knowledge and understanding. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's just a bunch, it's, just, it's vanity, it's empty knowledge. He says, we're going to receive power. I need some power, man. There's sometimes I get drained. I, need, I don't know about you, but I need some power. <laughs> okay, I need power. Let me, well, let's read. He says, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be what? witnesses unto me. Doesn't say anything about talking in tongues. That happened. Doesn't say anything about the gifts of the Spirit. We read about that in, in, in 1 Corinthians. That's, that's, it happens. We want that. We expect that. We look for that. The move of God in our service. But the main purpose of the body of Christ is not to have, a, you know, big pep rallies. That's not the purpose. Our purpose is to be witnesses. We come together in congregations, we meet on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and whenever we meet, and we encourage one another. We read the Word and we study the Word and we pray with each other and we, we, uh, we, we help each other. We come together and support one another. That's important is for the body of Christ. But all that is for the purpose that we could be a witness to somebody, that we could tell somebody about Jesus Christ. doesn't mean we have to preach to a thousand people. I mean, telling the person next door. I mean, whatever. That we could be witnesses. He says we're given power to be witnesses. By the way, the Greek word is the word for martyr, in case anybody's interested. Okay. He says unto me, that you can be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In New Kensington, in Pennsylvania, in the United States, around the world. With everywhere. We could be witnesses. And we know that this, this, this bunch here that got filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, they went out, and the Bible says they turned the world upside down with their preaching and their teaching. And they didn't have doctorate degrees. They didn't have all, this, you know, all these uh, credentials. All they had was the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's really all you need. So when we're talking about the Spirit of God, we're talking about the day of Pentecost, we're talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we thank God for the gifts and the, uh, and the manifestations. That's wonderful. But the bottom line is, you know, a lot of folks, they just look for that stuff because it makes them feel good. But he didn't give the Holy Spirit to make us feel good. He gave us the Holy Spirit that we could be witnesses. That we could be witnesses. Okay, now, I, I, want, you, I want you to turn with me over to the Gospel of John. And I want to read some passages here. When Jesus, John chapter 14, when Jesus was getting ready to be crucified, he, this is like his last discourse to his disciples. And we want to start on verse, uh, verse 11. Let's start at verse 11 and we'll just, we'll just read. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, Jesus was raising people from the dead. That's a pretty, I've never done that. I mean, we pray for folks, get healed, healing. We see some folks get healed, we pray for in filling his spirit, deliverance, those things. But greater works than these? What's he talking about? You mean, you mean I might be able to raise the dead sometime? Well, if the Holy Spirit, did it, if he did it through the power of the Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit, isn't it? Now listen, I'm not walking into funeral homes trying to raise people from the dead. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, that's not, God has a time and purpose for everything. But what he's saying here, and what I really think he means here is this, is that, you know, Jesus was one guy in one place. He could walk from place to place to place, and wherever he would go, he would heal and do miracles. But now he's telling them, you know what? You're going to do even more than that. Why? Because 
I'm going to have a whole bunch of y'all just going out through all the world, filled with the Holy Spirit, just like me, empowered with, by the Holy Spirit. So it's not just going to be one person in one place, but man, we got Christians all over the place, filled with the same Spirit. The same Spirit's in me, it's the same Spirit in Africa, and China, and Russia, wherever it might be, the same Holy Spirit. He's saying, you're going to do greater works. I'm giving you the Spirit, and, you, and i got a purpose for it. It's not, just, it's not focused on you, it's focused on everyone else. He says this. He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whosoever, uh, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is in the context of spreading the gospel, not in the context of getting a new car. Okay, this, this is not, all right. If you love me, <laughs> it took a little while for that to kind of get there, but. If you love me, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's a whole lot of folks that talk, but they don't do. <laughs> okay? All right. Now listen. And I will pray the Father. Now here we go. This is what this is all about. And he shall give you another comforter, a paraclete, that he may abide with you forever, live inside of you. Abide inside of you, the Comforter, the one who comes alongside and helps, the Holy Spirit, the power. He says, I'm going to pray that you receive the Holy Spirit as believers. He didn't just tell this to those 12 guys that were there, but he's telling, he says this for everyone. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, is for our children and our children's children until the end of time. This is a promise it's for everybody. He says, And I will pray and the Father will give you a, another comforter that he may abide with you. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he, it sees him not. Neither knows him, but ye know him for he dwells in you and shall be in you. The world, listen, the truth of God. The truth is not dependent on what we think. The truth is dependent on what's written in God's word. See, we've, we've, we've switched that around now. We want to take and we want to make truth dependent on our society, on our culture, on what we think works in, in the time that we're living in, on, on all this stuff. And, and, and we've taken truth and we've tried to bend it and mold it. And we'll say, well, what's true for me, it's true for me, and what's true for you, it's true for me. Listen, truth is truth whether we agree with it or not. If I tell you that the sun is circling around the earth, it doesn't matter how much I believe it, it's not true. It's the other way around. They know it. They proved it, right? So, but what people are doing now, Jesus is saying, listen, the Holy Spirit, he's the truth detector. He's, he's the one who will lead us into all truth. He's the spirit of truth. It says, we wonder why when we talk to people that aren't saved and we start giving them a bunch of scripture, they don't understand that. They can't. If we give them a testimony, and say what God has done for us, that might open up their ears. That might open up their understanding. They might start to listen. And until God grants them to understand, they won't until they ask the Lord to give them the ability to understand. Before I was saved, I didn't understand any of this stuff. When people read this and they, and they don't have the, the, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them, they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. You hear them every day. But listen to what he says. He says, The Spirit of truth, the world can't receive it, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I thank God he's in us. <laughs> I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world sees me no more. But you see me because I live. You shall live also. And he goes on and he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. Drop down to verse 25. It says this. But the Comforter, he was telling them that they were going to endure a lot of struggles. He says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. It's the Holy Spirit that quickens our understanding, that gives us the truth and makes us understand the truth. Peace I leave, I leave with you, he says. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He said that before. It's the Holy Spirit that comforts us and gives us truth. Look at chapter 15. 
Turn to chapter 15 with me. And starting at verse 18. Check this out. If the world hates you, oh, you know, we don't want to, I want to be a Christian and have the world hate me? If you're looking for a popularity contest, don't be, don't be a Christian. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before. What do you think? It hated Jesus. The world hates Jesus. Man, the world hates Christ. <laughs> it's, they, and, and, and they're getting more and more militant about it. Have you noticed that? You know, we've lived in a nice kind of stable for the last uh, several decades. We've been kind of like, oh yeah, Christian United States. But man, people are getting hostile. They're getting, they're getting aggressive against Christ. That's just like it was in the first century. So he says, listen, if they hate you, don't feel bad. They, that's because you, you're mine. They hated me. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. They'd build a building and name it after you. And because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Why do we think it's so strange that people want to take the Ten Commandments down from the schools and they uh, want to try to shut Christians up? It's, it's what, they, what they've been doing for a long time. If they did it with Christ, they tried to shut him up. They're going to try to shut you up too. They will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Persecuted in the name of Jesus. Well, like a lot of things in the name of Jesus, but persecution is like, hey, excuse me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, then they had not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. The reason why people don't want to hear what you have to say, because then they know you're telling the truth, and they got to do something about it. That's the way it was with me. People come tell me about Jesus. I knew they were telling the truth. I didn't want to hear it. I don't want to give up the stuff I was doing. I don't want to turn around from the stuff I, I thought was good and the, the stuff I enjoyed. Because I knew, they were, I knew it was true. He said, He that hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, then they would not have sinned. He said, but I showed them who I was. I told them I was the Messiah. I proved it by all the miracles that I did. And they still turned their back on me. But this comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written, they hated me without a cause. But when the comforter is come, I mean, we should have sung that song. The comforter is come. When the Comforter is come, when I will send unto you uh, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth with, which proceeds from me from the Father, they shall testify, he shall testify of me. Listen, the, the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you, he's the one, he's, he lifts up Jesus. He lifts up Christ. And when you're witnessing to somebody about Jesus Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. It's not you. It's not your wisdom. It's not your words. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you that empowers you to tell somebody about Christ and what he's done in your life. He's the power. And his, listen, he's not going to lift himself up. He's not going to lift himself up as the baptizer. He's, the Holy Spirit is sent to lift up Christ. He's not going to lift up the church of God on Catalpa Street. He's not going to lift up whatever denomination or building or independent, whatever. whatever that, he's not going to lift up a pastor or a preacher or a person. The Holy Spirit will lift up Jesus Christ. And when folks start lifting themselves up, you can better believe it ain't the Holy Ghost. Dropping down a little bit more in chapter 16. Starting at verse 7. And there's so much more in between, but I just kind of picked out. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. Remember, this whole thing started... When way back at the beginning of chapter 14, he said, I'm leaving. Jesus said, I'm, I'm leaving. Those are sad words. When you hear somebody say, I'm leaving, I'm going. They're sad words. Say goodbye. His disciples that thought they didn't know what was coming, they thought that he was going to be the king. They were like, You're leaving? Where are you going to go? 
What's going to happen here? What's, this is what this whole thing is about. I'm sending you another comfort. I'm, I'm not leaving you alone, thank the Lord. He said, I'm leaving. And they were troubled. That's why he said at the beginning of chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. If I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Okay? So he comes on and he continues. He says, I tell you the truth, it's expedient. It's a good thing that I'm leaving. People say, why are you leaving Jesus? You know, we're waiting, we're getting ready to set up the kingdom here. He said, it's a good thing, it's expedient that I go away. For if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. If I stay here, you're going to look to me, one guy in one place. I'm, I'm going to send you a comforter that's going to be in every one of you. And the ones that get saved because of your testimony. I'm, I'm, I'm going to send a comfort that's going to inhabit the whole earth. In spirit-filled believers, Christians who've been born again, put their faith in Christ, and have received the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. I'm going to, I'm going to send you guys all over the place. If we just stay in one place, if you're just hanging out in Jerusalem, what's that? But there's a whole world that needs to hear the gospel. There, there's a whole world that needs to see the light, your, your light shining, like you said, shine your light all over the world. There's a whole world that needs to see it. There's a whole world that needs to hear your testimony. There's somebody next door to you across the street that needs to hear something of what Jesus had done for you. He says, It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, now here we go. What's, 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 his, what's his job to do? When he has come, he's going to make everybody talk in tongues. Now, now I, I, believe in, I believe in talking in tongues. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. But this is like all believers have the Holy Spirit. You might not have received them gifts yet, but you've got the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you because that's, that's what the Word says. So he says, here's, here's, what, here's, here's, here's what it's going to be. Here's what the Spirit's going to do. Here's how he lifts up the name of Jesus. He says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness of judgment. Reproof. The Holy Spirit will begin telling the truth to a bunch of people that don't want to hear the truth. Because, you know, do you like to be reproved? You know what that means. Get scolded. Get put in your place. Get reprimanded. Nobody likes that. But the Spirit's job is not to make us holier than anybody else or point fingers or look down our nose at anybody, but it's the Holy Spirit that convince, convinces them, reprove the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. And I've said this before, you know, a lot of times when, if, you're, if you're talking to somebody and they're, and they're like in sin and you're ministering to them and you're doing so, you know, you do so lovingly, we've got to make sure we do it lovingly, and we say, hey man, you're in sin, you ought to like pray in God, for God to forgive you. The first thing you hear is, man, you can't judge me. Have you ever hear that? Who made you, who gave you the right to judge? Well, I'm not judging anybody. The judgment's right here. It's written down. It's, it's God that's judging. It's his word that says this. It's his word that says fornication is wrong. It's his word that says uh, uh, pharmacia, uh, uh, enchantment with drugs is wrong. It's his word that says this stuff. I didn't make it up. If it was up to me, I'd say, hey, do whatever you feel like. <laughs> I don't care. But it's, his word says it. The Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, why? Because they don't believe on me. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're on your way to hell. And you say that to people and say, you're so narrow-minded. I'm not. They, Jesus is. <laughs> Jesus says he was the way, the truth, and the life. I didn't make that up. I like to go to everybody and say, hey, man, just... You got to pray for me today. I got a funeral today. I, I, I do. I got a funeral at four o'clock. Guy called me. I know the guy. I've known him for years. He called me up yesterday morning. He said, "Can you do a funeral for his son? His son died." Uh, and I said, "Okay." And he said, "He was a Buddhist." I said, "Okay." I said, "Well, I told him. I said, listen, I can't do a Buddhist. I, you know, can I have to do a Christian funeral?" Yeah, <laughs> that. And he knows that. And he says, I know, we're all, he says, we're all Christians, and, and we, you know, we want, that's what we want. I said, okay. 
So then he calls me. So I got to go at four o'clock and do that, right? So he called me and he said, "Well, listen, I just want to let you know at three o'clock, uh, his brother called like the Buddhist whatever temple, and they're going to do a Buddhist thing at three o'clock." So I'm thinking, well, I hope it don't last longer than an hour, <laughs> because listen, two clashing. Some folks would try to make it, oh, he's in heaven. Ooh. It's two clashing, diametrically opposed faith, faiths, religions, whatever you want to call it. You pray for me. Because, see, I don't, I'm going to go walk into a bunch of people. I don't know what, I don't know what the Buddhist funeral is like. I, I might go early just to see, you know. I, I don't know what, the, I know what they believe. They're good people. They're nice, you know, I'm sure they're nice guys. But the thing is, Jesus said. He was the way, the truth, and the life. I can't apologize for that. I can't say, well, you have your Buddhist thing, and that's good, and you've got your Christian. No, I mean, it's, 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 he's, he, he reproves the world of sin. Because they don't believe on me, on, on Christ, he says. People don't like to hear that. They don't like to hear, well, I'm going to hell. I'm a good person. Right? You ever hear that? I'm a good person. You think you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. I try to be good. I don't care how good you try to be. You'll never get in if you don't have your faith in Christ. That's, man, you can't be good. Of, of, of righteousness, because I go to my Father... And you see me no more. Of what is right. God says what is right. Righteousness. Gee, they, he laid it down in his word. The whole word. We got a whole different idea of what's right now. We got a whole different idea of what, what passes, what's acceptable, what's okay, what's, uh, the, you know, the new morality, the new, mo the, the new normal, the, all this other nonsense that they could, well, you know, what, what, what was uh, righteous uh, 100 years ago is different now because now it's 2015 and it's, we all know different. Listen, what was right 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago is right today. God is right. He's always been right. What he says is right. There's nothing, nobody can change that. And if we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to just arm ourselves with the idea that we're going to have to tell people what's right, and they ain't going to like it. And they ain't going to like you. I'm not talking about looking down your nose. I'm not talking about pointing a finger. I'm not talking about carrying signs and say, you know, all these nasty things. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about telling the truth and love. If you love somebody, you don't want to see them go to hell. Amen. He says, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Oh, don't start talking about hell. Don't tell people about hell, man. They'll get... Mm -mm. Do you think... You know, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody believes in hell. They did. Somebody did a, a survey. Barna did a survey. That about everybody believes in heaven, but nobody believes in a place of torment. Jesus talked about the place of torment. There are two words, actually three words in the New Testament translated hell, but the two ones that really count, there's one called Gehenna. Jesus was about the only one that used that word. I think James used it one time, but Jesus used it when he talked about, uh, Gehenna was a, a place, it was like the garbage dump of Jerusalem, and it's where fires burnt constantly because they didn't have incinerators and trash compactors back then. So, so if a horse died, they take it to Gehenna and they throw it on a fire and let it burn. It keeps stinking. And, and Jesus said, hell's going to be a, a place where the fire isn't quenched. He said, that's a place where people will go when they die. In other words, the word Hades. It's the word that's used for the grave. It's used more often than the other word. We know in Hades, there was a place called Abraham's bosom. That place was taken up to heaven when Jesus descended. But there's another place in Hades. It's a place of torment where the rich man ended up. And he begged. He said, please, just put a drop of water on my tongue. It was a place of torment. That guy's still there waiting for the great white throne judgment. Hell's real. It's a terrifying thought. 
And Jesus went on and said someplace else, there's going to be a whole lot of people that's going to go there that's expecting to go to the other place. Oh, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Jesus said, you said it, but you didn't do it. You didn't do what my Father said. The Holy Spirit convinces the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The Satan is not in hell now, but there's going to come a time when he's going to be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And I guarantee he does not want to be there. It's not going to be a party. Jesus goes on and he says, we're, we're, we're wrapping up. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth has come, mm, He will guide you into all truth. You see, this is why I've said this. I stand up here and I read from God, I read from the Bible. Because this is God's Word. This is the Holy Spirit inspired God's Word, okay? And I, I read from the Bible and I, I try to express. What, what this says. And I tell folks, listen, just because I say it, don't you think that I can't, I can't get off the mark? It's the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. I don't care how good a, person, a good a speaker a person is. I don't care how educated they are. Education is a wonderful thing. Please. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you'll never understand the truth. People with doctorate degrees and years and years of studying Greek and Hebrew, they've sliced this book up and come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. Listen, it's pretty, it's pretty simple to me. Pretty straightforward. When the spirit of truth has come, in verse 13, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come, and he shall glorify me. He shall glorify me. I pray for us as a congregation. I pray for the body of Christ in our city. We fellowship with brothers from other churches on Monday night. We have the kingdom men in action and good brothers. Good pastors. We have a number of pastors who's come in, in, in different backgrounds, different, you know, uh, denominational, independent. We might do things a little differently. We might run our services a little differently. But one thing is the same thing. We all got the Holy Ghost. We all got the Holy Ghost. Young people, old people, my prayer is that everyone in here would realize and understand that if you're a believer in God, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's there. And my prayer is that he'll start to come out. That we would become baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit to a point where we'll be so full of God, so full of the Spirit, that we can't help but when we walk into a place, they'll know. They'll know we're saved. There's, there's a, when I, was, I was blessed and honored to be able to do uh, the funeral for Sister Ruth's sister-in-law. And, and when I first heard that she had passed away, God gave me a scripture. And it, I didn't even know I was going to do the this, this service. It was last week, the week before last. But it was over in, over in 2 Corinthians. And John, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get this one up. But 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I thank God for John and John that do the computers because I switch up on them all the time. And, uh, and I have... I, uh, ch chapter 2 and verse 14. I'm, I'm going to leave you with this because this is, this, is, this is what having the Spirit. The Apostle Paul says this, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Always. Triumph in Christ. We're winners. I, it might look like you're losing. It might look like you're getting beat up. But we're, he always causes us to triumph. And he says this. And make manifest the savor of the knowledge by us in every place. 
in other words, when we go into a place filled with the Spirit, we got people, they don't even have to, they don't even have to talk to us. They just know us. They just sense there's something about it. It's like when you walk in the house and somebody's cooking a ham. You know what's cooking before you see it. <laughs> For we are unto God, unto God, a sweet savor of Christ. He, man, he, he just looks at us. Even when we're going through things, God just like smells that. Wow, that's Christ in them. And he, and he goes on and he says, In them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? When we go into a place, the Holy Spirit inside of us, this is, this is, this is about Pentecost. This is about being filled with the Holy Ghost. When we go into a place and we're saved and we meet another Christian, we say, hey, brother, hey, sister, how you doing? I, I told a story about when I met old brother John Pesarek down at the Cocker and <laughs> Hyundai. Man, he walked in there. I knew he was going to start witnessing to me. I knew I could, I could tell right off the bat. He was going to, I was sitting there half asleep and he come walking in and he started talking. I said, this guy's going to witness to me. Because I knew I could tell. And when we run into people that aren't saved, they say, here, come in, here comes that Christian again. I always tell the story. I was like when I worked in the mill. And those, those folks from Dayspring would come in and they knew the Lord. Back, this is way back. When, you know, and they still do, but I'm saying it was way back. They, they, they knew the old Pastor Ray had them all fired up, you know, and they, they come in there, and their helmets, they have all kinds of stuff on the crosses and scriptures and everything, you know, and they come in, and they, you knew they were saved by that, but, but then they, you knew they were, you know they was going to start talking about Jesus. They just, you weren't going to get too far before they start talking about Jesus, because that aroma, that fragrance, it comes up when you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. It gives you hope. It gives you assurance. It tells you the truth. It helps you understand what God's Word is saying. So my prayer is this Pentecost, we've been talking about encounters with God. That's one encounter we all can have. Face to face with Jesus and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I want to pray this morning, this Pentecost, and we're going to, we're going to wrap up, we're going to close. But I want to pray that every one of us be filled with the Holy Ghost, that every one of us would be filled to overflowing, that, that the Holy Spirit, if you're born again, if you're not born again, then, you know, you need to be, and we'll give you opportunity to do that. You can come up here after, and, and Brother Leo and myself, and we'll be glad to pray with you uh, and encourage you in the Spirit. But for those of you that are saved, I'm praying, Father, in the name of Jesus. For those of us that have been born again, that have put our faith and trust in you, and that Holy Spirit is, is living inside of us, Father, I pray that you would allow that Spirit to begin to come out. To begin to, to come out and give you praises. And, Father, I pray that you would encourage us. There might be some of us who are saved, but we're maybe kind of afraid to witness, or maybe we're a little shy, or don't know, uh, don't know exactly how to say, Father, I pray that you would light us up with the power of it, that we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, and you would light us up to be able to tell others about who you are. To be witnesses. That's why, that's why you gave the Spirit, to make us witnesses. I pray, Lord, you would make us witnesses to who you are, what you've done, that you give us a, you've given us a testimony, and, won't, and we won't be afraid to share it. That you open up the doors, we might be able to lead somebody to a saving knowledge of who you are. Because that's the only thing that's worth having. That's the only thing worth leaving behind is a soul saved for Christ. That's the only, that's the only way we're going to lay up treasure in heaven by winning souls to Jesus Christ. Father, give us that hunger. Give us that desire. Give us that drive. Light us up. Give us that fire. You might use us. And I pray, Lord, for those who are, who are born again, Father, that you would fill us to overflowing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father, there have been those who have been praying. There have been those who have been praying for it, Father. And I pray, God, that you would allow this, Father. We just pray, stand in agreement with them right now in the name of Jesus, Father, that you'll do that work in their lives, Father. That they'll have a testimony. They'll come back and say, man, I, I, I received a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Father, we pray for testimonies. In the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray you would use us for your glory. That the Spirit 
the, comfort, the, the comforter that you've given us will help us be able to lift up the name of Jesus. Why don't you stand, please, as we... That comforter that you've given us will be help. You'll help us to lift up the name of Jesus in everything we do, on the workplace, in the neighborhood, wherever we might be, Father, that they'll see, they'll smell, they'll sense the presence of God in our lives. Father, I pray if there's anything that's standing against that, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We pull down the strongholds. We pray for deliverance in the name of Jesus. For some of us, Father, we need deliverance in our lives over certain things, Father. You know each and every person here. I pray, God, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to bring deliverance and healing, wholeness, cleansing, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. That we'll be under the blood, Father, the sins that we've done, the, the, the mistakes that we've made, the things that we've, the, the, the things that we've committed. Father, I pray, God, we get it under the blood. We, we see ourselves as being forgiven because we're dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. And, Father, you will allow the Holy Spirit to begin to just lighten up us. Father, let us glow with the, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. That we might be able to lead somebody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory, Father, as we prepare to leave this place but not your presence. There's one song, and it's called Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place, but we're not talking about this room. We're talking about this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Go ahead and touch, just touch your heart right now. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in... Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God love us. As we prepare to leave this place, but not your presence, oh God. Help us tell somebody about Jesus this week. In the name of Jesus. Anoint us, Father, to be your witnesses. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and grant you peace. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand and greet each other. Amen.